My father said to me in a conversation that I treasure, your clients will come to you seeking knowledge. Knowledge is fungible and you'll provide it, but they will really be coming to you seeking courage to do something difficult. He said, true person de confiance, earn our livings through providing courage. Welcome to Talking Billions. We talk about big ideas, big inspirations, big topics. We take on the hardest subject of all, money. How to make it, save it, keep it. But our conversations lead us to an even bigger question. What it means to live a rich life beyond money. My guests share their practices, principles, and evergreen wisdom. I'm your host, Bogumil Baranowski, author, TEDx speaker, investor, and a founding partner of Seacard Associates, a boutique investment firm founded in New York City. Join me on this quest to unearth the wisdom of the ages. My guest today is Mr. James Hughes. Jay is my dear friend and a mentor. We talk every month, but this is our first ever recorded talk. He shares his treasured conversations with his late father, a lifetime of experience and a boundless wisdom of family wealth. Mr. Hughes, a resident of Aspen, Colorado, is an author, advisor to families, founder of a law partnership in New York City that represented private clients throughout the world, now retired from active practice of law. His wonderful book, Family Wealth, Keeping It in the Family, talks about family governance, wealth preservation, with focus on the avoidance of the shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves proverb, and on the dynamic growth of families' human, intellectual, social, spiritual, and financial capitals toward their families flourishing. We will talk about the challenges of the shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations proverb, and the courage it takes to overcome it. The five capitals looking beyond the financial capital of a family, a hundred-year thinking in a family, looking back and looking forward around a family table, how to talk with kids about money, a story of a toy purchase, how to help families and individuals prosper and flourish. Please help me welcome Mr. James Hughes. Hello, Jay. How are you? Good morning, Vogelbos. You and I have known each other for several years. And the last few years, we had the pleasure of talking every month. You were a guiding voice for my last book, Money, Life, Family, and you offered me invaluable advice and wisdom all around on many topics. And for that, I'm grateful. My pleasure. Today, I want us to pretend that no one is listening and have a heart-to-heart -heart chat about the many topics that keep coming back in our conversations. Family wealth as a topic. Where did your interest come from? How did you get started on this wonderful journey? Well, Gamel, there are two main moments that got me going. The first is when I was four years old, I overheard my mother and father having a heated conversation. My mother was agitated. He was about money and they had plenty of money. They weren't, they were not wealthy people, but my father was a practicing attorney and was making good living for that time. But my mother's father had gone bankrupt in the depression. I put all his money in his father's savings bank. And the savings bank went down. So from one day to the next, literally, she left school in the morning for a lovely home that had help and came home to the afternoon to a for sale sign. This affected her all of her life. And so in this conversation with my father, she mentioned the shirt sleeve to shirt sleeve proverb. Her grandfather, my great grandfather, had been a German immigrant and came to America and uh, did very well in the uh, late 19th century. So I heard that proverb and it stuck with me, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. In 1974, I found myself in Singapore, very odd reasons for being there, no, no idea why, really, invited to come halfway around the world, very strange, oh, mysterious, I'd say. Sitting in front of this Chinese gentleman, I had no idea why he invited me to come halfway around the world. And he said, Mr. Hughes, I want you to help me help my family avoid shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. Boom, boom. Uh, those two really synchronous conversations set me on this path. And the goal ever since, as you know, has been to try to relieve families of that suffering and help them see wealth as well-being, 
and help them prosper. What do you think is the biggest fear that wealthy families have always faced? There is one, but it comes in two dimensions. One is external and one is internal. And that is essentially the loss of their capital. And by that, I mean not the external loss through war or Holocaust or whatever it may be, and not simply their financial resources that support, but the loss of their family members, their cohesion, and then internally the inability to make decisions that enable the family to have future generations. There's one problem, and the shirt sleeve problem describes the outcome, either the external or the internal reality, but I think it's the same issue. You just face it two different ways. In your book, Family Wealth, you write about the dynamic growth of families, human, intellectual, social, spiritual, and financial capitals. The investment profession often starts and ends with the financial capital, but you go beyond that. Could you share more about the other capitals? Well, if we really look at a family's self, the first thing we would look at ourselves if we were demographers is how many people, not how much money. If it was a family we were looking at, it had to be two or more people because you can, you can have a single person household. You can't have a single person family. We'd be looking at the ages of those people, what the questions are that are likely to be the ages. Are there married ins? Are there grandchildren? We'd be looking at them. And as we were looking at them, we would have a human experience, a qualitative experience that would emerge from our scientific studies. We become humanists and scientists. We, we'd be looking at them that way. No one would look at them as their balance sheet in the financial context. Well, that's just obvious, but believe it or not, it is not obvious to the financial profession because the financial profession is laser-like looking at the financial capital. Well, obviously, that leads frequently to a lot of misunderstandings because what the financial people are looking at and managing isn't the family, it's its financial capital. The family itself is trying to organize itself. One of the things that I've tried to help families do is orient themselves by using a hand gesture, which I'll use now. Let me just say to the wonderful people that are going to be sharing our journey this morning with us. If your financial capital, your thumb is wiggling up and your other fingers are like this, that is the death of a family. There's no family. You notice there's nothing qualitative there. Right. This has no purpose. Mm -hmm. Might help the financial advisor's personal balance sheet. <laughs> if you turn your hand upside down, what immediately emerges is spiritual capital purpose, social capital, joint decision-making, intellectual capital, lifelong learning, family, human capital, thriving human beings. And now Bogomil, the financial capital has a purpose, right. supporting the growth of these. Those families go a long way. It makes me think immediately, if you remove the financial capital from the equation, can you have one happy, flourishing family building all the other capitals more successfully? In other words, does money get in the way? I think the best position, rather than generalizing, the best position for a family is that it sees its purpose as growing these. Right. It's nice to have this helping. But you needn't have these to grow these. And there are millions of families on the planet doing well, as Tolstoy said, who you never see because they're doing fine, who are about growing these. Don't have much of this. Then, of course, Tolstoy said, every family that's going out of business does it uniquely and very loudly. <laughs> and those we see in the newspaper, or we see them as our neighbors when the lawn is mowed. Wise words, wise advice. You emphasize the importance of good governance, decision-making in a family. If a family is more than one person, how big of a group of people can effectively make decisions? And if they can't, wouldn't the family naturally break into smaller independent units? Is this the right way to think about it? Let's pull this apart. It's a wonderful question, and there's a, there are multiple parts to it where social anthropology 
of social psychology begin to enter in. There is a theory, Bogomil, and I think it's a very sound theory, that human groups through the 350,000 years of our existence, remember they found us in Morocco 350 instead of Africa 2, part of Africa, East Africa 250. It appears that the, there is a sweet spot for human groups of 150 people. It's not well known, I would say, generally, but there, there is something about 150 people where human groups can grow to that successfully. And then when they seek to grow beyond that, there is some interior decision-making issues that cause then there to be some activity. Now, within that 150 people, looking at joint decisions, we tend, because we're not social anthropologists or cultural anthropologists, we tend to look at the nuclear family and say, can it make decisions? That's an open, good question. Can it make decisions? Not always. But if it can make decisions, it learns a system of joint decision-making, then it probably can use that system to grow clans. That's not a bad thing, by the way. It's just a, a way of describing different households, the children's different households. And then if those households can make good joint decisions and choose to, that's a voluntary question, they might become a tribe. You see that? So nuclear family clans, separate households, tribe. And then that tribe can probably get to 150 people making joint decisions. And then there may be some impetus, some centrifugal force that says maybe those need to be a new tribe. Now, that's not necessarily so. There are some families I've represented with 350 members making great joint decisions. So it isn't inexorable. But I would say that within that 150 number, it's quite possible. The reason that I suggested that over our conversations over the years, that this question of joint decision-making is so important is that we have texts. I'm not going to mention them here. It's not necessary, but we have texts in our field, E-X-T-S in our field, not Twitter texts, but books <laughs> that make it very clear that something between 70 and 85% of families over the first three generations, that shirt sleeve proverb that we talked about at the beginning of this morning, do not make good joint decisions and go out of business. Now, what do the statistics tell us? Well, if a family doesn't have a joint decision-making system or it has one but can't make it work, when an external taxes, confiscation, holocaust comes, or internal, there's a dis internal disputes that can't make it work, then between 70 and 85% of those families by the third generation are out of business. That doesn't mean there isn't some money around, but the family fabric is essentially either broken for heat, for fission, they blew up, or more often, by the way, without a joint decision, they die from cold inertia. It's not written out quite so clearly, but you can find it that most families fail the shirt sleeve problem because they become cold. But that's all joint decision-making. You feel that? Fusion, Goldilocks's food's just right, is a good joint decision-making system. Make sense? Can I add to that? You and I talked about the family changing. We have fewer kids and the pyramid, the demographics are changing. Does that affect how families manage their affairs? They don't have as many siblings. Does that change the dynamic a little bit, the makeup of the family? I think there are two remarkably important things about modern de demography. To be very candid, almost no one in the financial services, lawyers, bankers, accountants, et cetera, have paid any attention to. The first thing is that a lot of those families are simply going to disappear in the first generation by choice. So an awful lot of the planning process doesn't really take into account their choices as to how they will live their lives without children and then how they will dispose of whatever financial capital they have, that's called inversion. And there's, no, there's nothing in the literature, I've been writing about it, but almost nothing in the literature. And in fact, the vast majority of people you go to to plan and think about it are still using systems that assume dispersion. Okay. The second thing that comes out of the question, though, is more complicated. If that couple chooses not to have children, I'll come back to one or two children in a minute, but let's just say, was just to have no children. 
eventually they have to make some decision on the accumulated financial capital that they've accumulated in their lives. Where that tends to go is to nieces and nephews, not to philanthropy. Some goes to philanthropy. Now, why nephews and nieces? Kinship, and that's, look at DNA, not blood. No families have made of blood, it's made of DNA. Blood's a fallacy, but DNA is there. Essentially, the uncles and aunts have the same DNA almost as the parents. So they have an innate interest in how the nephews and nieces do. There is also joint decision-making in those families it's just not as obvious in the decisions that are being made. But the aunts and uncles are watching very closely how the nephews and nieces develop. Now, also, interestingly, going one step further on that, because I think it's a very important point, in most human communities, again, if we went to social anthropology, Pokemon, in most human communities, it's the aunts and uncles who socialize the nephews and nieces, not the parents because of the inherent conflict between parents and children. One of the failures in modernity, if you will, or the reality of living apart, is that the roles of aunts and uncles have been lost. That is a human tragedy for the question of successful development of the nephews and nieces. It's a real human tragedy. Now, you come back for a moment. I know it's a long answer, but so what? We're having fun. I hope the audience is having fun too. When you get parents and one or two children, that looks like a family that could have more generations. In theory, it could. The interesting thing about one or two is it's still less than the 2.1 that you need to replicate yourselves. Right. So the joint decision making in, those, in that system may not have a long term, simply because the demography may be against it having that. So you've asked a really interesting question. And the modern demography is changing most of the things that even the academy understands about the family and absolutely oblivious most families to the reality of the new demography. It's a little bit like the fish swimming in the water. We don't realize that the water we're swimming in is moms having 1.2 children around the world. Still thinking of moms having three and four children. It's not happening anywhere almost. It's a changing family dynamic. Tremendously. It puts a lot of responsibility on sometimes one single individual. Yes, it does. It eliminates some potential tensions among numerous siblings. We might add here that the great problem the Chinese created them for themselves by the one-child policy are the little emperors. Right. Four grandparents, two parents, one child. A lot of attention. Yes, and that little emperor has a strong opinions, not buffered by any sibling experience. In this age of little emperors, I'm thinking of the age of instant gratification, shrinking attention span, accelerated change. But you talk about a hundred-year mindset. It might be needed more than ever, but the mainstream thinking couldn't be further from it, it seems. What can we do about it? Let me start by a subject that you and I have discussed very frequently. The ancient adage in history, that history does not repeat, it rhymes. If we looked at Rome for a moment, people are saying, what, where is he going with this instant gratification and behavior and he goes to Rome? Come on, what's he talking about? The Romans essentially bred themselves into the end of their civilization. They started having two children, then one and a half children, then 1.2 children, then they needed the barbarians, or quote unquote, or met, which means others, not rich people, to come do all the work. Then they needed them for the military, and out they went. We have to look at the question of what happens when you have very few children. What happens when you have very few children in a natural way is that your attention to them is greatly increased over your attention to them when you had four or five children, as an example. This is not good for children. Now, we have endless books being written for parents. Those books, however, don't recognize the water these parents are swimming in as a 1.2 world, not the world of three and four that they grew up in or may likely have grown up in. This is a really strange time for families because demography 
is destiny, right? So we have the same issues as human beings have had for 350,000 years. We are that form. We are, our psychology is a function of our species and our experiences. But we're in a really weird time, not just for the family, but then for the children because of this over-concentration. So in modernity, we get a lot of funny terms getting born, like helicopter parents, or now for the iGen, the youngest group, not quite, there's some younger, but the younger cohort, we have snowplow parents. What does that mean? Snowplow parents is a term developed by social anthropologists and social psychologists that the parents plow the road for the child instead of the child being out with a shovel, shoveling the walk. What we're seeing tragically is that one third of all freshmen in all higher education institutions are in mental health services in the first semester of their arrival at college. That's the human catastrophe. And it's perfectly understandable that we don't have to look for the causes. To a certain extent, the problem is the effects are creating human catastrophe. And this demography, which I'm weaving through our conversation, but it's what isn't understood by people, is having dynamic consequences when we look at the family, which is the building block, by the way, of a flourishing society. Aristotle said the fundamental building block of a flourishing society is a flourishing family. That base we'd all like to live in and grow up in is, are the families flourishing? And the answer is the family is not only changing its dem by virtue of its demography, and, but it isn't flourishing. When you talk about family wealth, you talk about a hundred year mindset beyond the shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves challenge. And with that context of a hundred year mindset and the current backdrop of same day delivery, everything happening in a minute, a hundred years seems so far away, such a foreign concept. It's very helpful in terms of thinking about an investment plan for a family, but it's very hard to embrace by the younger generation that you talk about, or by people in general these days. Why would you even think about a hundred years? A hundred years is, of course, an aspiration. I could have said 250 years as an aspiration. What I would say helps a family think about this and certainly has helped my family think about it and many of the families that I've been able to share this wisdom. Bogomil, in tribes, coming back to something we were talking about earlier, so family, nuclear family, clans, tribes, up, let's say up to 150 people, all over the world, there are successful tribes that are thousands of years old. I could argue that the Jewish diaspora is thousands of years old. I could argue that the Yamamoto, who are a major tribe in the Amazon, are thousands of years old. I could give you lots of evidence that this is possible. Right. All tribes grow elders. Do we grow elders in modern society? Oh, dear, that's an interesting question, Mr. Hughes is posing, or Jay is posing. No, we don't. But tribes, successful tribes through all of human history, and that's prehistory as well. I'm going back to our 350,000 species. We, tribes grow elders. And elders are interested as the chiefs for peace, by the way. They're not chiefs for war. That's what the boys do in the spring. But chiefs for peace are the most important person in a tribe, aren't they? Because they're looking at the tribe's long-term survival and, and thriving. That's why elders emerge in an evolutionary way from in an anthropology, they evolve because they're necessary or otherwise they disappear. But if you disappear something that's necessary in the human community, you're in trouble, aren't you? Taking something out of your thriving equation that you need, right? So what does the elder do? The elder is always thinking in 100 years increments because that's the elder's job. And is the system that the elder is not supervising, but rather maintaining and mediating. Elders don't make any decisions. They mediate experience so that, that human community keeps thriving, keeps doing what it evolved to do in the environment it came to life to do. These are people who are always thinking a hundred years ahead. Now, our audience, imagine for a moment arriving at the most beautiful place that they go in life where they're absolutely happy, their thriving place. And ask them to imagine bringing with them people they love the most in the world at their tribe. 
they're sitting in that beautiful place and almost certainly in a circle, right? Or at least a, a semicircle, maybe the elder sitting here and they're sitting, but they're gathering. They're doing, there's a fire, right? Of course there's right. a fire. People are gathering. Something's going to happen there. They can't wait to get there. And here's what the elder's going to say. And by the way, the Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee, who are a 600-year-old tribe thriving in America, and the elder gets up and says something like the following. We're all sitting here together. We're going to make some decisions together. But the elder says, let's hope that the care and diligence and wisdom we will bring to our decision-making today honors those seven generations ago who made it possible for us to be here today so that those seven generations forward will honor what we do. All tribes do seven generation things. There's nothing that keeps a new set of parents starting out a new Genesis story. Every new set of parents is writing its own Genesis story. It comes from somewhere. It has antecedents, but essentially it's writing a Genesis story. When you and Megan stood on that beautiful cliff in that magnificent setting in Georgia, you were starting a Genesis story. You may not have been thinking about it, but I know that's what you were doing. I happened to be able to participate, which was an incredible thing by Zoom. But I have a feeling, knowing you, you have a hundred year thinking. How many times have we discussed together and your parents and grandparents, almost every conversation. That's true. If we go back to when your grandparents were born, which is likely in the 19 teens or 20s, right? We just went back, on, oh, we just went back 100 years. Oh, my goodness. That's right. How, how did we do that? <laughs> and at, are Megan and Bogomil going to have a 50-year journey together? I hope 60, probably. Huh. Now we went 60 years that way. 100-year huh. thinking in families is the easiest thing in the world to do as soon as we realize that we knew people who were born 100 years ago or close to it. And by the way, just to make people really fascinated, almost always they've asked their grandparents, if they were lucky enough to know them, about a generation before that, or the grandparents just wanted to tell them about their parents or grandparents. And Bogomil, it won't surprise you that the families I help, including my own, do an exercise just for fun of storytelling, doing just what I said, and they go through about 250 years of their own history by going back to the oldest person and what they told them about somebody older, and then the six-year-old who's sitting there is going to live to be 100, 250 years. Only families can do that, and that's our inherited oral tradition and our awareness of time. I'm a big fan. I notice how it's a challenge in today's world where it's hard to keep somebody's attention between two commercials three minutes apart and to have them pause and think about it. But I like the way you present it and the framework that you suggest, how we already think in terms of 100 or maybe 250 years to begin with. And we might not be as aware of it as we could be or should be. Yeah, I agree. You have a very clear idea of a perfect advisor to the family. And again, in an era of salesmanship, monthly sales quotas, you have a completely different vision. Please tell me more. My father said to me in a conversation that I treasure early in my legal career, he was a lawyer of extraordinary ability, whose clients not only loved him, but everybody in the law firm that he led wanted to work for him. Those are two remarkable qualities. We were talking one day about what the nature of a professional is. So I'm going to use, take the word advisor, and I'm going to flip it to the four noble professions, ministry, medicine, high academia, what is it to be human, law, and then banking, but it is growing human communities, not intermediate. These are the four noble professions plus banking in this unusual way. My father said, Jay, a person in one of these noble professions, including banking in the way of growing human communities, he said, your clients will come to you seeking knowledge. Knowledge is fungible and you'll provide it. But they will really be coming to you seeking courage to do something difficult. He said, true person de confiance, earn our livings through providing courage. Look for an advisor 
who provides you with courage. I like that, courage. As part of this interview series, I have conversations with wealth creators and wealth inheritors. And we spend a fair amount of time on the topic of childhood and upbringing and their relationship with money. Do you think we learn it all when we're young or we can unlearn it later? I mean, our relationship with money. Bogomil, let me start by something that great therapist and psychiatrist at the Ackerman Institute in New York taught me nearly 40 years ago. Apparently, Freud, our great discoverer of the unconscious, pioneer, therefore got some things wrong that others fixed, but that's pioneer's destiny. Go look and do the best you can. Freud said something that our, my friend Peter shared with me 40 years ago that he and I have been working out with many people in the cognate professions that serve families ever since. Lots of people know Bogomil that Freud said that great human adjustment, he meant happiness, but adjustment being who he was, lies in human beings learning to love and learning to work. And by work, he meant vocare, vocation, not labore, labor. So I repeat, he said, great adjustment, happy people that he met in his profession had learned to love and learned to work. Everyone knows that that's taught in all psychology, psychiatry, and almost any institution trying to understand human beings. Freud apparently said, and Peter was very sure that he heard this, that Freud went on to say that the two great impediments to adjustment slash happiness are sex slash gender and money, and that money is the most difficult of all because no nice person will speak of it. That statement by Freud repeats itself in my life almost weekly, if not daily, in the questions that my clients and my friends and my associates and, and now the many people that come to me and for ideas, conversation. I believe Freud is absolutely right. I believe money is not the root of all evil. No, I think that money is an incredibly complicated subject for human beings. And I agree that my experience of teaching Freud, if you will, around the world, and I probably, I don't know, use that expression in thousands probably by now of conversations that I've convened, I find no one who talks about money easily. Now, I may, there may be people in the financial services industry who can talk about money easily, but not when they're talking to their wives or husbands, and certainly not when they're talking to their children, and absolutely not when they're at the country club or wherever they're associating with their friends. Freud's absolutely right. So getting the capacity in a family system to look at the question of learning to love and learning to work as a quadrants, and then sex slash gender and money as more quadrants, and money as the lower right and the one that's toughest of all, or however you want to organize it, realizing that is an enormous realization toward actually being able to deal with what the problems that Freud was talking about. So now a hint for our listeners. Some of the best advice I ever got on parenting with money is you're standing in a toy store with a child and the child is noodling, niggling. I want that toy. I want that toy. The one thing you must never say to the child is we can't afford it. And the child knows that isn't true because you'll never get back to even. The great parents in that situation say, oh, we're choosing not to have that today. Oh, it's extraordinary. That is just so sound, isn't it? No lies, talking about money, and making it very clear that we have boundaries. And that doesn't say to the child, you'll never have it. It opens up for that child a question. And I can say in my own life, making this very personal for a moment, that my mother and father's post-depression era parents, my brother and sister and I earning things, not being given them, although we did have wonderful birthdays and Christmases. My brother and I, our fondest memory was earning the $75, which in 1952 was a lot of money, to buy a rowboat so that we could have a clamming and crabbing and muscling business in the summer. Can you imagine anything more fun than going out in a boat in the low tide and crabbing and clamming and whatever, you, and then walk up the street selling out your stocks? These are not my experiences. These are, these can be anybody's experience. It's true. But talking about money is 
the great thing about it is integrating it into a discussion by actions that are actions that enable temperance and prudence, the two great Aristotelian virtues, or in the Confucian world, the frugality. The, the all one isn't being parsimonious, or, or you can't hate Silas the Martyr. And the, no, but can we talk about money? That's Freud's great question, and he's absolutely right. We can. And if we can't, we're not going to be happy in the sense of deep adjustment and serious happiness. So this question is hugely important. And I would say fundamental to happiness. Now, I'll add one more thing. Lots of couples today, by the way, about 40% in America already, the woman earns more than the man in her relationship. I'm looking for the moment at the heterosexual because we don't have the same statistics yet on the same sexes. What do you say? 40% of the women in America in relationships with a man make more than the man. You think any of our listeners said, Wait a minute. First of all, I don't believe it's true. Well, those are the real statistics. And then they thought, but historically, that's been really weird where the woman had lots more than the man. I bet those are hard relationships, given the fact that men were supposed to go hunt and women have children. I don't mean that in a bad way. That was actually our evolved psychology, isn't it? And the women chose the men to have their children with who did more hunting, brought stuff home. Huh. Think those couples are having a good time talking about money? No. Thinking they're having an even more difficult time than Freud imagined, because he was living in a world where less than 5% of women were in those relationships, not 40%. But he was right. We just have in modernity, because of the magnificence of the changes in the capacity of gender to make choices and financial choices and partner choices, we never had, by, never, by the way, no human being ever had those choices. You know, we're a crazy world, modern world we live in. It's never been harder to talk about money, but it's never been more important to find a way to talk about it. I assure everybody that's true. Freud got this one 100% right. Yes. Point. Exclamation <laughs> point. Using my pencil as an exclamation point. <laughs> oh, Jay, <laughs> I always see you as someone who has a beginner's mind and who continues to learn while you enjoy sharing the knowledge and wisdom with others. And that's the role your foundation has taken, advancing the study of the family governance and generational well-being. What's your hope, your vision, your dream for it, for your foundation? Bogomil, the donors who created this, to my total surprise, has nothing to do with me. When I asked them, oh my goodness, uh, what am I supposed to do with this? They looked at me with joy and they said, you have to figure it out. Oh boy. I said, come on, give me no, no hints. But basically then I did give some hints. And what they really asked me was, would I try to enable more families in the world to flourish? And I then added, would it be okay with you if in helping more families flourish or enabling them to do hopefully, that we would could imagine then that they in turn would create a flourishing society, right back to our friend Aristotle. So that's our job. What we're attempting to do is to help more families all over the world, not necessarily with financial resources, but families, these people, as we were talking earlier today, think through the questions of what is the water they're swimming in? What's the external reality? And how is it changing? How is it evolving? Just a minute ago, we said that 40% of the women in America make more than the men in their relationships. That's the most astounding sociological and anthropological change that no human beings ever lived in. So that water's different, isn't it? What we're trying to do is not tell anybody what to do. What we're trying to do is explore that water. The same thing as we were discussing earlier today about 1.2 children instead of 2.5 or 7 children. What is that world going to look like? The hundred year thinking that you're asking. We're, we are trying to help people explore the remarkably wonderful questions you've asked me today. These are the foundational questions of the family, families that are coming, their Genesis stories, families that exist, families that are three and four and five generate tribes that are hundred, a thousand years old. What is their wisdom? What does the human experience actually enable us to understand? about the water that a particular family is swimming in. And then not only how can they explore that water, understand it in light of how they feel about it, because their feelings go back through shared 
evolved psychology and shared social experience? And then how can they themselves make better decisions, do the things that enable them, learn to love, learn to work, manage sex and gender, and prosper? And I mean by prosper, flourish. And can they reach their human qualitative possibilities, supported by quanti quantitatives? Jay, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for all this time and thoughtful wisdom that you decided to share with me and with our audience. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You are a wonderful partner, and I am really privileged to have been asked today to sit with you and share the wonderful conversations we have monthly with all the people sitting out there in the ether that maybe we can help. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It would be. Thank you again, Jay. My privilege. You were listening to Talking Billions. We talk about big ideas, big inspirations, big topics. We take on the hardest subject of all, money. But our conversations lead us to an even bigger question, what it means to live a rich life beyond money. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment and follow, subscribe, rate, and share with friends and family. We rely on word of mouth to promote the show. One click for you means the world to us. Thank you. Until next time, your host, Bogomil Baranowski. The content of this podcast is for general informational purposes only, and so are the opinions of members of Seacard Associates, a registered investment advisor and guests of the show. This podcast does not constitute a recommendation to buy or sell any specific security or financial instruments or provide investment advice or service. Past performance is not indicative of future results. More information on Seacard Associates is available in its Form ADV disclosure documents available at advisorinfo.sec.gov.